want to welcome everyone as people streaming. We probably gonna get started tonight. Um, my name is Helen Long and I'm the chair of SFU's Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies. I'm also the convener of this year's President's Dream Colloquium. And I would like to welcome you all to um, our second public event, a conversation with Professor Susan Stryker. Now, before we start the event, I would like to first acknowledge that I am privileged to be connecting in from my home uh, in downtown Vancouver, which is on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. I invite you to acknowledge and reflect on your relation to the land you're connecting from in the chat. And it's also my honor to be able to invite Elder Margaret George from the Swahaluk First Nation to share a blessing with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to come and join with us during this time. And welcome to the territory of the First Nations people, the Musqueam, Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and Kirkutlam. Just a quick prayer for you. Great Spirit, thank you for bringing us together today. Just guide each and every one of us on the path that we're on. Thanking our communities for allowing us to do the work that we do and our families for the time that we're not with them. I ask Great Spirit just to clear our paths, give us strength and give us courage. I ask Great Spirit also to bless the little ones who are witnessing what we are doing and just keep our families safe all my relations. I'm grateful to Elder Margaret for her prayer and warm wishes for all of us. This year's President Dream Colloquium on From Conversations to Action, Creating from Social Justice Research is made possible by generous funding from the Office of the President and with the wonderful support and collaboration of the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, SFU Public Square, and the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies, which is celebrating 50 years of teaching social justice issues at SFU. For this year's colloquium, we are really happy to be able to invite back four scholars who previously held the Ruth Wynne Woodward Endowed Chair in Women's Studies, the first ever endowed chair to be established at SFU. So on this great occasion, it's my pleasure to invite our president, Dr. Joy Johnson, to say a few words about the colloquium. Well, thank you ever so much, Helen. Um, it's terrific to be here this evening. And I wanna thank Elder Margaret for starting us off in a good way. Um, I wanna acknowledge that I'm joining to you this evening from my home um, on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh people. And it is indeed uh, a pleasure to, um, to, to live on these lands. And it's part of our obligations to acknowledge this. Um, so uh, I'm, pl I'm pleased to do so. I am so pleased about the President's Dream Colloquium and what it represents. This year's Dream Colloquium from conversations to action, creating from social justice research is a, such a great topic. Uh, and I'm particularly excited about today's event, a uh, conversation with Susan Stryker. I wanna welcome everyone who's joining this evening. Um, it's a really uh, first time for this colloquium, a program to be delivered virtually. Uh, so it's a bit of an experiment from that standpoint, but I think um, it really um, is terrific to see so many of you, over hundred of you with us. So uh, welcome to all of you. This dream colloquium was launched in 2012, and it was really to create a forum um, for interdisciplinary engagement uh, across our faculty, our staff, our students, and our community. Um, and really, um, it focuses on themes of interest across our university and the wider community. The colloquium includes a combination of public events, such as this evening, uh, and student seminars. The series is a little bit different in the past, and I think um, those who developed it are particularly excited because it's really presenting a more interactive conversational format, um, which is um, really interesting. Students are going to be learning from leading social justice advocates about how they have made an impact, and then the students are going to be developing their own creative ways to move conversation into action. 
Uh, this semester, we have 18 students from diverse disciplines uh, joining uh, the seminar series. Uh, and they include disciplines such as, of course, gender, sexuality, and women's studies, resource and environmental management, contemporary arts, education, urban studies, uh, all of these uh, students from these disciplines are enrolled for credit in this colloquium. They'll also have opportunities to learn not only from faculty members and guest speakers, but also from each other. By promoting interdisciplinary evidence-based dialogue on important topics, the Dream Colloquium reflects SFU's vision to be an engaged university while providing a rewarding and I hope inspiring uh, and interdisciplinary student experience. So we're delighted this evening um, uh, to present today's conversation uh, in celebration, slightly late, but in celebration of International Women's Day. Today's very special guest, Susan Stryker, is an award-winning scholar and filmmaker whose research, writing, and creative works have helped shape the cultural conversation on transgender topics over the last three decades. Uh, a previous Ruth Winwood Wood Endowed Chair, um, we are so excited to welcome Susan back to Simon Fraser University, even though it is virtually. This colloquium series also celebrates, as you heard from Helen, the 50th anniversary of the Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies at SFU. It's been 50 years, just think about it, um, since Simon Fraser University offered the first course in women's studies. And incredibly, that first course was titled The Geography of Gender. You know, really um, so amazing to see that course offered 50 years ago. We indeed stand on the shoulders of many, many scholars who have built GSWS into what it is today, a groundbreaking, cutting edge and interdisciplinary department. So I wanna really congratulate Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies on this incredible uh, milestone. I also wanna just acknowledge that an event like this takes uh, a village. Um, and I'd like to thank the faculty and staff members who really conceived of the colloquium and worked so hard to make it possible. Uh, our colloquium partners, Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, the Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies, of course, and SFU Public Square. Thanks also to Stevie Benish and Stacey Makertoff from Graduate Studies Office, as well as the Dean and Associate Pro Provost Jeff Dirksen and Associate Dean Roxanne Conchazzi for helping to organize the 14th President's Dream Colloquium. So I know you've heard enough from me. Um, I know you're gonna have an amazing uh, evening this evening. You're gonna have an opportunity to share your ideas and questions during the conversation. And I really encourage you to do so. So with that, I'm gonna pass the floor back to you, Helen. Um, thank you, Joy, so much for um, talking about the rich history of the colloquium uh, and for such welcoming words. Um, before I introduce uh, Professor Stryker, I would like to just give you a brief rundown of how this evening is going to proceed and also remind you of our community guidelines. Um, we will first begin with Professor Stryker's presentation, after which you can submit your questions for her using the Q&A function. A student from our colloquium class, Colleen Maben, will be the moderator, and she will also remind you of the details at the start of the Q&A. Closed captioning is available if you click on the CC button at the bottom, um, and you're also very welcome and encouraged to use the chat function throughout the event, but please observe our community guidelines, um, which will be on screen very soon, um, and, be, and stay respectful citizens. Finally, there will also be a draw for prizes, which are generously provided by the SFU alumni office before we finish. So do stay to the very end and see if you get lucky. It is now my great pleasure to welcome my old friend and good colleague, Professor Susan Stryker back to SFU, where she held the Ruth Wynne Woodward Endowed Chair in Women's Studies from 2006 to 2007. Professor Stryker is currently a Professor Emerita of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Arizona, where she founded the Transgender Studies Initiative and the Faculty Cluster Hire. She currently holds the Barbara Lee Professorship in Women's Leadership at Mills College in California. She's an award-winning scholar and filmmaker whose historical research, theoretical writing, and creative works have, as Joy mentioned, shaped the cultural conversation of transgender issues since the early 1990s. She is also the author of many influential books and articles and the founding co-editor of the field-defining journal TSQ Transgender Studies Quarterly, as well as the co-editor of two massive volumes of Transgender Studies Reader. 
She's the recipient of many prestigious awards, including an Emmy Award in 2005 for Screaming Queens, the feature documentary that she co-directs with Victor Silverman, and most recently, the Local Genius Award from Tucson's Museum of Contemporary Art in 2018. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Professor Susan Stryker. Hello, it's really great to be here. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Joy, and thank you, Helen, uh, for that really warm uh, introduction. Um, it is, it's so nice to be back in Vancouver, even virtually, uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the GWSS department and um, to, to be part of honoring the, the legacy of the, the Ruth Lynn Woodward professorship. Um, I just want to say that for me to hold uh, that professorship was actually a, a life-changing event, uh, not, um, not, not exaggerating at all, um, because it is the thing that uh, actually allowed some of the work that I had been doing for some time to be sort of legible and recognized within the academy, uh, you know, that I sort of got taken seriously as a legitimate scholar instead of just a, you know, community-based rabble rouser who happened to have a PhD. So I'm just, I'm, I'm forever grateful for that uh, opportunity um, and for all the friendships that I made or deepened with colleagues uh, in Vancouver during the year of that professorship. Um, I want to acknowledge that tonight I am speaking from my home in San Francisco, which is on the occupied and unceded land of the Ramatush Ohlone people, um, and that I make this acknowledgement uh, as, a, as a starting point for the ongoing and unfinished work of reconciliation and decolonization that lies before us all. Um, I'll speak tonight for about 15, 20 minutes. Um, about a place that I've spent more than a quarter century uh, uh, researching, the intersections of Turk and Taylor Streets and San Francisco's inner city Tenderloin neighborhood, which for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time in San Francisco is roughly analogous to um, Vancouver's uh, downtown east side neighborhood. Uh, if you'll give me just one second, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and uh, so you can have some things to look at while I talk. Give me one minute. Let's see. I figured this out just a second ago. As I was saying before we got started, it's like I just updated my um, my PowerPoint and they moved everything around. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, here we go. Pull my text back up. All right. So uh, my own interest in that intersection, the intersection of Turk and Taylor Street and San Francisco's Tenderloin stems from work that I've done to recover the history of one of the first known acts of collective militant trans resistance to police oppression, which took place there 55 years ago. In August 1966, trans women, street queens, gay hustlers, queer kids abandoned by their families, and other marginalized people fought back against a police raid at an all night restaurant once located there, Compton's Cafeteria. That night when the cops came in to raid the place in a routine act of harassment and to cart the cafeteria's trans patrons off to jail, one of the queens threw her coffee in a cop's face. And with that, the customers rose up and resisted. They turned over tables, threw sugar shakers through the windows and drove the police back into the streets vandalized a police car, burned down a newsstand, and fought all up and down the streets of the neighborhood as police vans um, filed in and reinforcements arrived. In the aftermath of that resistance, the city of San Francisco responded in ways that made life more livable for many of its transgender residents. Um, 
Uh, you can learn more about this historic act of trans resistance and defiance by watching the documentary film that my friend Victor Silverman and I made about it, uh, Screaming Queens, The Riot at Conference Cafeteria, or by reading about it in my book, Transgender History, The Roots of Today's Revolution. The revolt at Compton's was a bold assertion of the fundamental right of trans and gender variant people to exist in public space. Uh, one that contested the criminalization of their lives. Uh, San Francisco honored that legacy of resistance and survival in 2017, when it officially designated the neighborhood around the old Compton's cafeteria as the transgender district. Um, largely, I'm pleased to say, as a result of research that I had done into the neighborhood's remarkable trans history, which laid a foundation for empowering trans lives in the present. Um, uh, as far as we know, it's the first um, uh, municipal district that has explicitly been set aside to, um, to honor the, the, the cultural importance of a transgender population. And I encourage all of you to visit the district's website at transgenderdistrict.com, transgenderdistrictsf.com. Um, as I mentioned at the outset of my remarks tonight, um, holding the Woodward professorship um, really helped launch my academic career. Uh, I went from Simon Fraser to another visiting gig at Harvard and from there to a tenured position as associate professor of gender studies at Indiana University. I then eventually moved on to the University of Arizona um, uh, where I was eventually promoted to full professor. And I have just retired from that job uh, and come home to San Francisco where as you've heard, I currently hold another visiting professorship at Mills College. And now that I'm back in San Francisco full time, after having spent the past 14 years working in other cities, I wanted to get plugged back into local activism because I am at heart actually just a community-based rabble rouser with a PhD. And I was curious about what had happened in the Tenderloin since 2005 when I made Screaming Queens or even what had happened in the neighborhood since 1966 um, when the riot took place and how life had changed there for trans people and other neighborhood residents. What I discovered outraged me and sickened me, so much so that I decided this past summer to develop a new research and media making project, which I hope will become another film and the not too distant future called At the Crossroads of Turk and Taylor. Crossroads in many cultural traditions from around the world, but particularly in those of the African diaspora are symbolically charged places where one realm of existence touches another and dangerous transformative encounters take place across some significant difference between those who meet there. It's where Faust met Mephistopheles to wager his soul, and Robert Johnson made a deal with the devil to learn how to play the blues. A crossroads is literally a place of crisis, where in order to move forward, we must choose one path or another. More than a mere intersection, the crossroads are a place to dream and to conjure new realities through the path we choose. What crises now inhabit the crossroads of Turk and Taylor? And what paths forward um, might there be uh, when that intersection is our point of departure? Some of the people who fought back that night in 1966 lived in the Highland Hotel, which once occupied the floors above the old Compton's cafeteria or in many of the other cheap hotels that lined Turk Street. Uh, these hotels were some of the very few places that visibly trans women were allowed to live back then when working in the neighborhood sex industry was one of the few jobs available to them. I learned that nearly 30 years ago, the former Highland Hotel, um, or I, I learned that for nearly 30 years, starting in actually 1994, uh, the former Highland Hotel has been a glorified jail disguised as an inner city apartment building misleadingly labeled 111 Taylor Street Apartments. The facility is operated by Geo Group, the world's largest private prison company. 
Although California Assembly Bill 32 banned private prisons, the law created a huge loophole for any facility, quote, providing educational, vocational, medical, or other ancillary services to an inmate. Geo Group's Taylor Street facility is technically a residential reentry program or halfway house that provides just those services under contract um, for inmates of both California state prisons and the federal prisons operated in California. But don't be fooled. Uh, this is just a way to rebrand an incarceration facility as a social welfare agency. Geo Group prides itself on pioneering new forms of incarceration, including electronic monitoring as a prison without walls and camouflaged carceral facilities like the one at Turk and Taylor. It runs immigration detention facilities for ICE. These are literally the same people who make money by putting kids in cages and camps along the US border with Mexico. All told, Geo Group manages 95,000 beds at 129 carceral facilities worldwide <clears throat> and provides what they euphemistically call community supervision services for more than 210,000 people. In 2019, the last year for which financial records have been made public, Geo Group made profits of $166 million on assets worth $4.3 billion. My project on the crossroads of Turk and Taylor asked how we might summon the legacy of militant trans resistance to the state violence of policing in the prison industrial complex and use that history in the present to bring about necessary social change. I draw, uh, I draw inspiration for the sort of work that um, I hope to do as a historian from the words of the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche who said in 1876, we need history, but we need it in a manner different from the ways in which the spoilt idler in the garden of knowledge uses it. We need it for life and action. Those who are oppressed by a present need and who want to cast off their burden at any price have a need for a history that sits in judgment. In the time that's left to me tonight, I want to do a bit of show and tell about some of the activist work that I've been involved in this year that um, I, I hope to be a history for the present that allows us to sit in judgment. Uh, on June 18th, 2020, my friend Jay Carter and I uh, helped organize a protest called Courthouse to Compton's. Uh, we're both white people who try to do solidarity work on anti-Black racism and show up for racial justice uh, and who had grown impatient with the checkbook and online activism that we had each been doing during the early days of the pandemic lockdown. We were inspired by all of the youth-led marches and rallies taking place in the U.S. at that time and we wanted to make our own, contrib to, uh, our own contribution to that moment of highly visible public protest. Our goal was to follow the guidance and leadership of black trans women, but to do the labor of coordinating and organizing the protest ourselves with a team of collaborators drawn from our own personal networks. We wanted to provide an outlet uh, for the anger that we anticipated over what we, was, we were sure was going to be bad news from the Supreme Court on Monday, June 14th when the decision was expected on whether titles seven and nine of the Civil Rights Act protected against discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender expression, and to link that sense of anger to trans people's history of resistance. <clears throat> the plan was to assemble in front of the federal courthouse and march a few short blocks to the site of the old Compton's cafeteria at Turk and Taylor for a rally. As it turned out, the Supreme Court decision that day unexpectedly went in our favor and a celebratory vibe infused the march. It felt for a couple of hours like we had won and that we were taking the streets in victory. Uh, I'm now gonna play just a few minutes of um, a video clip. Um, uh, it's something that I shot from the top of the bus that we were using as a mobile platform for the rally to just provide you with a little context of what you're about to hear. One of the staff members of the trans district, uh, Janelle Luster, was already on top of the bus when I climbed up there as we were about to leave the plaza in front of the courthouse and start marching. 
a row of police officers on motorcycles watched us as we got rolling. Janelle said, Susan, you're one of the organizers. Do you know if anyone invited a police presence here today? And I said, no, this is um, an unpermitted protest action engaging in civil disobedience. And she said, well, then we're going to chant, fuck the police. And that's what she did. Um, so as you watch this video, uh, please pay attention, not just to the slogans being shouted and the signs and the crowd, but uh, I also encourage you to look at the tent encampments along the sidewalks and uh, in the vacant lots um, that, you know, this was right in the um, right in the, the crux of the, the, the worst days of the pandemic in San Francisco that just brought all of the, the myriad social issues we face here up, up to the bubbling up to the surface. Um, Sorry, Susan, I'll just let you know that uh, we, we actually don't have sound right now. Okay, all right. All right, well, I, I hear that you did not have sound for that. Uh, apologies, it worked in tech rehearsal. Um, but um, so besides people shouting, fuck the police and defund the police, um, you know, there was a, a lot of people were chanting black trans lives matters um, among many other slogans. All right, at the end of the day, uh, we assembled uh, a coalition of about 25 co-sponsoring organizations, uh, some of which are listed here. Uh, I won't take the time to go, um, to go through them all in the interest of time, uh, but we'll just uh, uh, sort of move on by saying that, that we hope that the coalition that coalesced around the event that we organized and the energies that we encouraged to gather that day and the goodwill that we tried to foster uh, will blossom into an ongoing campaign to help push GEO Group out of 111 Taylor. Um, I'm just briefly going to highlight a couple of the other things that have happened since then, uh, since June 18th. Uh, I also participated in um, a project called In Plain Sight, um, uh, which was, um, the, the organizers called it a highly orchestrated mediagenic spectacle that took place over the 4th of July weekend in the US. Um, where participants, there were 80 of us, um, came up with slogans that we wanted spelled out in, um, in the air by skywriting airplanes flying over detention facilities, immigration courts, borders, and other similar sites of vulnerability to, um, to migrants uh, to make visible in the air above us something that uh, too often remains unseen and unspoken on the ground. Uh, my own contribution involved making a short film um, 
where um, we used Zoom to actually bring together protests going on at the Eloy detention facility near Tucson, Arizona, uh, with the protests that was going on outside uh, the Compton's Cafeteria riot site, uh, the Geo Group facility in San Francisco. Um, one of the people who appeared in this film in Arizona, um, Carolina Lopez. Um, um, let's see, I, I'll just let you read her um, her words for yourself since I can't. Oh, no, and there we go. Yeah, my little uh, thumbnail thumbnails of who was in the chat here. We're covering up the words, but she she said in this film, um, she, she's a um, um, she says a transgender Afro-Mexican woman who runs um, an organization called Mariposas Sin Fronteras uh, and runs a safe house for uh, trans immigrants who have crossed the border uh, in Southern Arizona. She says, for, and she was uh, detained in the Eloy facility for many years. She says, for me, prisons should not exist. People uh, that are inside the detention centers, most of them don't have anyone but themselves. When I was inside, I didn't have anyone. You looking at me from wherever you are now makes me stronger. This is my weapon. It helps me grow as a person. We should all continue to fight for what is just. That's all for what it should be and not, um, and, and it is not. Solidarity is what is going to change everyone's heart from all over the world. I imagine uh, the world is one without borders or walls. The walls will fall or be turned into bridges. Um, to move quickly through the last couple of slides here, um, on uh, August 23rd, 2020, for the 54th anniversary of the Conference Cafeteria riot, uh, members of the Transcultural District uh, got together to paint a Black Trans Lives mural in the intersections of Turk and Taylor. Uh, on November 14th, uh, I had a chance to speak at another rally outside uh, the building, which was sponsored by uh, the Free Them All Coalition, which is uh, primarily an anti uh, detention and immigrant support organization protesting against both ICE and GEO Group. And finally, um, uh, an event that happened just this past, um, this past Sunday, um, on March 7th, um, there was another rally outside the building that I uh, helped document, sponsored by the San Francisco-based uh, national Black liberation newspaper, The Bay View, whose co-editor Malik Washington is a resident uh, of the 111 Taylor Street facility. And when Malik blew the whistle on a COVID outbreak uh, that uh, happened in the facility starting in January, Geo Group retaliated by confiscating his cell phone, charging him with escaping from his work detail and threatening to send him back to prison for the remainder of his sentence. Malik is suing Geo Group and the Federal Bureau of Prisons on uh, First Amendment grounds, arguing, <clears throat> excuse me, arguing that his constitutional right to free speech had been violated. So to conclude, when I stand at the intersection of Turk and Taylor uh, today, what do I see? I see the social fabric of the historically left-leaning city of San Francisco, tattered by tech-driven gentrification, displacing longtime residents and creating one of the worst home affordability and houselessness crisis, crises in the country. I see a desperate need for affordable housing, particularly among communities of color, even more pressingly among black and indigenous people of color, especially if they are also queer or trans or non-binary or feminine appearing or excluded from meaningful work or currently or formerly incarcerated. I see the still ongoing COVID pandemic officially acknowledged by the WHO just a year ago today, which continues to take a disproportionate number of black and brown and indigenous lives. I see ongoing police violence. I see ongoing occupation by the carceral complex ongoing transphobia and racism and poverty. But when I stand at the crossroads of Turk and Taylor, what do I dream of? 
When I stand in those crossroads, I dream of liberating the historic site of trans resistance from its occupation by a private for-profit prison company, from its occupation by a, um, I just read that. Um, um, I dream of turning that building into something that better serves the many unmet needs I still see there. What would it be like for our actions in the streets to make the operation of Geo Group's Taylor Street facility impossible? to collectively insist that the needs of the formerly incarcerated be met by other means that served them better and profited no one but themselves? Why not demand of the city of San Francisco that it divert money from police and jails that disproportionately criminalize and contain people of color and trans people to support a community-led effort to sustain Black trans lives, to support um, the lives of the formerly incarcerated by turning what's now a private jail into low-income housing? Why not provide office space for government agencies and nonprofit organizations serving our communities? Why not reopen a cafeteria on the now vacant ground floor that Compton's once occupied to provide training and employment opportunities for people exiting incarceration and re-entering the workforce? Why not partner with the neighborhoods, museums, and arts organizations to create historical and cultural programs and exhibits to showcase the Tenderloin's inspiring history of resilience, resistance, and survival. All of this could be possible to the extent that we collectively assert our political will to make that dream a reality. Okay, that's what I've got. Thank you very much for your, your time and attention. And uh, I look forward to the, the next uh, bit of, of the program tonight. Hi, Susan, it's Colleen Maben. Um, I am moderating the uh, question and answers portion of today. Um, I'm an arts education PhD candidate at SFU. Um, and I'm sharing with you the questions from the colloquium students to begin. So um, our first question for you is, given the personal aspects of your scholarship and research, what motivates you and inspires you to continue doing the work? Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, I hope it doesn't sound like too trite, but you know, like, all of the work that I have done feels like it's sort of like I'm engaging with questions that feel necessary for my own survival. You know, it's just like, you know, that it's like, I'm trying to figure out things that I need to know to live. And I figure if like I need them, that other people probably need them. So there's something that's actually kind of self-interested in some of the work that I do. It's like, you know, you know, smash the state in transphobia. It's like, that serves me. You know, it's like, I think other people have a stake in the game too. And so it's like, okay, I, I feel like I have found, you know, what maybe the Buddhists would call right livelihood. You know, it's like, I have found the way to use my interest in history, my skills in research or for communicating to, to do something that, that, um, you know, that, that serves others. It's like, it's, it, it, it really does feel like it's, it's, uh, it's service and that there's pleasure in that. Um, you know, so that's part of what keeps me going. You know, it's just like, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a curious person. I like to learn things. I like to try new things. I like to, um, um, you know, I, people have read off tonight, like a list of things that I've done over the past 30 years. And some of like, that list of accomplishments is just because I think, oh, here's the thing that needs to get done and I will do it. And it's like, and then I'm bored and I want to go do the next thing. You know, it's like, so I just kind of keep, keep finding some new thing to do. Um, and that, yeah, that sense of curiosity uh, is what drives me like that hunger for um, novelty, for like learning new skills, moving into different milieus. Um, you know, so it's just like, yeah, I'm always like, it's like I'm playing a video game. I'm always just like trying to take it to the next level until, um, you know, somebody pulls the plug on me. So. <laughs> um, in the class, we spent quite a bit of time on your work, my words to Victor Frankenstein. And so in our conversations, we um, became curious ourselves about what you think 
of, um, or do you think the attribution of unnatural and monstrous to trans bodies is still relevant today when the concept of femininity is expanding beyond reproduction? And considering that, how would you use the, would you use the same language or different language and imagery now? Um, you know, that, that's another great question. And curiously, it's a question that I have been asked, I would say maybe like four times in the last two weeks when I've been doing public events. Um, you know, it's definitely something in the zeitgeist right now that I think um, what, what I hear from some of my colleagues who, who teach my work is that a lot of students in the you know, current you know, 18 to 22 year old demographic have grown up in a world where it seems so much more possible to be trans, you know, like it's an, it's an unevenly distributed ability to be trans. Being trans still falls harder on people who are marginalized in other ways. You know, than it does for people who like being trans is the only kind of social oppression they they tend to tend to face, and you know, so there's that question of like, well, you know, back in the day, like, you know, weren't trans people so marginalized that it made you feel monstrous, and now kind of haven't we been welcomed into the light, and you know, and it's a more diverse and inclusive society, and there's more opportunities for being so called like normal trans, and I would just say, I. I don't think that's true. You know, it's like, yeah, there is greater scope of life for many trans people. Um, but, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, being cisgendered is a privilege that aligns with so many ways that the dominant culture imagines what bodies do and are for. And trans people, however, like cis passing they are, or however, like accepted they are, or however normalized their life has been, it's like, we are never going to be cis, you know, we, it's just like, it's just not going to happen. And that if you predicate your sense of personal comfort and acceptability and feeling all right with yourself on as a trans person on how cis like you can be, and you disavow that transness that has like put you on your life's journey that maybe you have like succeeded in some way of like you know finding a good way of living it but I think if you're disavowing that transness and your difference which can seem freakish to other people it's like it's ultimately really disempowering you know it's just like I don't think of monstrosity as a negative word, just like, you know, we've reclaimed that word queer, you know, it's like if somebody calls you a queer and they're not one, it's like maybe them spiting words, but you know, it's like we use it about ourselves, right? It's like, and queer is this thing that can be like, you know, interesting or critical or whatever. And it's like, I think the same thing about monstrosity. It's like, you know, the, the negative attribution of monstrosity comes from people who are afraid of monsters, but monstrosity is powerful. It is like, it is like, it's like the sublime. It's like, it's like this thing that says you, you don't fit the normal definitions of something. You violate categories. You, you, you engage with things that other people are afraid of or that they abject. And it's like, if you can dwell in the power of that, um, that, that, that being cast out from the normal and return back into the social order with this sense of empowering difference, it's like, why would you ever want to give that up? Why would you ever want to disavow that? You know, so I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I'm not enraged all the time, like that, that articles, like, in a, about trans monstrosity was a, a motivated by an affect of, of rage. But it's like, what I really, I think that rage is only half of it, you know, like, it's like you in, enraged by the violence that abjects you and throws you out of society, um, you know, but also it's like, it's not just rage. There's also like, for me, like the sense of joy, you know, like there is like a sense of joy and freedom that comes from allowing myself to be a person that's not trying to measure my own success or worth based on criteria that I can never meet. It's like that freedom feels so powerful, you know? 
Uh, and so there's like rage and joy, like together in the same moment. Maybe we will call that like non-binary affect, you know, like to hold both of those things together at the same time. Um, all right, maybe that's, that's enough, I'll stop. A stunning answer, thank you, that was amazing. Um, we've got some time to take some questions from the chat. So I'm going to begin with a question um, from Sven Robinson. Uh, he says, you hold the Barbara Lee chair at Mills, another trailblazing progressive leader with whom I collaborated many years ago as a Canadian MP. That's Mr. Robinson, not myself. Uh, do you have any thoughts about political activism with the Barbara's Democratic Party as one vehicle for change for trans equality? Oh, you know, I, I, um, um, I, I feel like I'm pretty much to the, to the left of the political spectrum in the US and I have my frustrations with, um, you know, I think all of the, the institutional political parties. I do think the Republican party has become at this point, nothing but um, a vehicle for fascism. And it's just like, it's just to be resisted at every turn. Uh, I think the democratic party has sort of taken the center right, center and left, you know, as the sort of a big tent party right now. I haven't, um, I'm very cynical about the democratic party. Um, you know, I, I think it pays lip service to a lot of issues, but ultimately it's, um, you know, it's the party of neoliberal capitalism um, and that it's not going to save us. Uh, the laws are not going to save us. You know, institutional politics are not going to save us. And yet it remains vital to, um, to I think, <clears throat> have access to the levers of power in the state to move things in the right direction, even though I position myself on the, the left as a critic of those kinds of um, in institutional party politics. Um, I think the Democratic Party has a, a great progressive wing, you know, just like I, you know, I, I was a Bernie Sanders supporter, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, you rule. Um, Biden's way better than Trump, um, you know. Um, I kind I, I of keep saying the you know s s slow death of neoliberalism gives us more time to breathe than the accelerated you know violence of you know Trumpist ethno nationalist reactionary populism. So you know it's like I'm I'm happy with where we are right now, but it's not enough. And, um, you know, I look forward to seeing what the Biden administration is able to do um, on, on trans issues. And, you know, I think like weirdly enough, I mean, Biden has always been pretty good on trans issues. Um, you know, I mean, back a decade ago, he was, you know, saying it was a, a cause that he supported, you know, he, he, he is very much in favor of, you know, what I would call like a liberal inclusive model of, of uh, recognizing trans rights and trans needs. Um, he's in favor of um, <clears throat> provision of transgender related um, healthcare services through the expansion of, of our healthcare, you know, system here through Obamacare. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, Right now, I'm I'm in this moment of like catching my breath from what we've been experiencing for the past few years, guardedly hopeful that something better will be able to happen under the Democrats, but like still wanting to push um, harder from the left and to um, to not put my not put all my eggs in the basket of institutional politics. I think trans people need to be doing a lot of community organizing and street activism and mutual air uh, care and aid, you know, for ourselves, <clears throat> you know, and um, at really like imagining uh, what, a, you know, what, what um, the um, sort of Afro-Caribbean feminist scholar Sylvia Winters like writes about when she talks about sociogenesis. It's like, we have to become a new people, you know, and that work of sociogenesis of like becoming a new a new body politic that in which trans bodies have a different relationship to that bo body politic. There's many avenues for doing that kind of work. 
Um, you know, it's like, it's not in, institutional party politics, voting, representative democracy. It's like, it's only like one, one tool in the toolkit, an important one, you know, suppression. They wouldn't be trying to suppress voting rights in the US if voting wasn't important for how power is exercised and life chances are distributed, you know, but in, uh, party politics only gets you so far. Great, thank you. I think we probably have time for one uh, more question, but we'll see. Um, so again, from the chat, um, someone has asked, can you please speak about the significance of a transgender district, especially its distinctive cultural and political contributions beyond what urban gay districts, districts or neighborhoods provide for a city? Um, well, I think, I mean, one, I, I'm thrilled that there is a transgender district in San Francisco and, you know, per perhaps it's no surprise, you know, given what I was just saying about party politics, it's like I'm also very cynical, <laughs> you know, that um, where the cultural districts came from in San Francisco it was a citywide initiative in 2017, where a member of the Board of Supervisors who was planning to run for mayor of San Francisco was trying to curry favor with different uh, constituencies throughout the city and was proposing different cultural districts. So there was like the Filipino cultural district district or the, the, you know, the, I mean, there was already a Chinatown and a Japantown and there was already a, 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 a Chicanx, Latin, Latinx cultural district in the mission. And so a lot of the uh, newer cultural districts that were coming along besides the Filipino district, there was the transgender district, there was a leather district, there was the gay district and the Castro, you know, like this is San Francisco, remember, right? And so, part of what that did was it put city money into these different districts It paid for staff members um you know it paid for some community services but a lot of it you know i would say it was kind of symbolic you know that it was it was about um representation you know um it was like putting pink, white, and blue rainbow flag decals on lampposts. It was about banners from, you know, and signage, you know, as much as it was about, you know, social programs or, or you know, putting money in people's pockets or providing, you know, access to healthcare, or what have you, in the Tenderloin, um, in the, the trans district. And so, you know, there, there were things that have come out of the district, like, trying to stabilize his, historically like trans and queer serving businesses in the district, like, you know, drag bars or, or what have you. And, you know, you can criticize that as a way of like putting public money into private pockets, you know, it's like, it's just like a transfer of public funds into, you know, small business. And so like, what's the difference between stabilizing a small business that serves the community or might be minority owned versus you know a, yeah to tran a, a, a trans transfer of public money to the you know the the, the, the to property owners mm. you know, it's like it's it's like it's not necessarily a progressive move um but you know in relationship to the question of what does a trans district do that a gay doesn't it's like well you know i mean there's the, the castro is a really different place than the tenderloin which is a really different place than the historic leather district down on folsom street you know that there are ways that um gay unmarked um is like it's like cisgender and it's often white and it's like it's 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 a different it's just a different constituency, you know. Gay doesn't, in fact, encompass all of the significant differences of, you know, different groups that get rolled into the rainbow flag, you know, a lot of the time. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just like there were, you know, like there were like gay bars that would not allow trans people to come in because they thought they would lose their liquor license, you know. It's like it's mm. like it's not it's not always like one big happy family, and. You know, the city of San Francisco recognizes the diversity and complexity of the queer community that has made San Francisco its home, you know, at least until, you know, things got so expensive here in the last decade that you know, everybody had to move. Um, but um, so, yeah, it's like I, 
I, I say I'm, a, I'm kind of an opportunist. It's kind of like, you know what, if the city like is gonna create this trans district, it's like, okay, like what can we do with it? You know, like how can you like resist the parts of it that you think cynically are just like kind of self-serving and how can you use it as a platform for doing the kind of work that you think might happen? It's a place where you struggle, you know, not just the thing that you say thank you for. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you for uh, giving so much time and attention to our questions. Um, I can see in the chat that people are very uh, moved and connected by your, your words. Um, so with that, I'm gonna say thank you on behalf of all the students and uh, everyone else involved. And I'm going to pass it back to the uh, people that are making the webinar start and go. Hey, thanks, um, it was thank great. You. Um, so thank you, Colleen, for the wonderful moderation. And of course, thank uh, Susan for just a tremendous conversation. I really miss the way, you know, you have really huge ideas, but also you speak with such nuance and thought. And you're radical, but you're also opportunistic and pragmatic, so which is very non-binary in all your thinking. So thank you so much. You gave us so much tonight. Um, so before we leave, I just want to plug our next event. Um, uh, join us for the next two Dream Colloquium events. You can see the details on the screen. And also we have a prize draw and I want to announce the two prize winners. The first is um, uh, these are prizes given from the SFU alumni office. Uh, the first one is a prize for $150 SFU bookstore prize and it goes to Evan Vipond. Um, the second prize is a DoorDash voucher or SFU swag prize worth $50 and it's going to Diana Prykop. Um, you will be notified. You will get a uh, information of how to claim your prizes from the alumni office. So thank you and good luck. Um, so thank you, Susan. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's been a wonderful evening and I'm really happy to see so many of you. So I hope you will have a great night this evening and hope to see you in another event. <laughs>